Davy Wexler's 17-year-old mind is overflowing with thoughts of demise. She hopes to find answers to the cruel questions that keep coming to her. The biggest existential cry falls over her head, and there seems no way out. At least for now, this is the truth. One seemingly ordinary morning, she prepares to go to her father's funeral. Trying her best to postpone saying goodbye, she tries to act as if she's failing to find something. But soon we see her standing at the side of a freshly cut field together with her brother named Jason. The warm words are said, and to her credit, Davy endures it all very courageously. She spends the rest of the day alone in her room. Grief seems to not touch her in its full force for now, as she reads a piece of newspaper in which her father is depicted holding a surfing board. Still, her eyes remain dry as she keeps thinking about trivial things, like how rain might get the grave all muddy. Her mind seems to be avoiding looking at the harsh reality. Davy's aunt, Bitsy, tells Gwen, Davy's mother, in the next scene to come and visit her in New Mexico whenever she wants. She's ready to help in any way she can. They are standing in front of a cafe entrance that is covered in police tape. They live upstairs. A group of teenage boys shattered the window of the cafe that night. Davy is woken up by their laughter and the sound of breaking glass, followed by Gwen's loud screaming. The family sleeps in one bed shortly after. The next morning, Davy leaves her cat with her best friend and, together with Gwen and Jason, travels to New Mexico. The one person to express grief is Gwen, the others prefer to spectate the largest balloon festival in the US, while all she wants is to follow those balloons in the sky and never come back down on Earth. The place where Bitsy and her husband, Walter, live is in Los Alamos, the location at which the renowned scientist Oppenheimer worked on his Project Y. Bitsy knows everything about this place since she works as a guide in a local museum. She knows that this is not a vacation for the Wexler family, but she still maintains a positive attitude to create a warm space for the people in grief. While settling in, Davy takes a package out of her bags and puts it in a safe space. This thing seems to be quite important to her, but we don't know what's inside yet. After parting with this meaningful object, she looks outside and sees her brother talking with Walter about his car. He seems to genuinely enjoy being in this far-off place with new people. Davy strongly desires to be able to feel the same way, but she finds herself unable to feel pleasant emotions. The next morning, she rides around in her bicycle, and the wind in her face seems to liberate her soul. Soon, she comes up to a canyon and decides to be adventurous. Carefully, as the sun begins to set behind the horizon, she starts descending a rocky slope. She isn't used to such activities, though, so she soon loses her balance, slides down the sandy terrain, and hurts her ankle. A sudden sense of loneliness comes over her, and she starts calling for her father. Not knowing how to handle this strong emotion, she's confused and desperate, but soon she is taken out of this state of mind by a young man, who was just walking by when he heard a noise coming from down the slope. The boy is all covered by climbing gear. After a short conversation with Davy, he realizes that the latter has no intention to be friendly, but regardless, he maintains a kind attitude and offers her a hand. He seems to be quite an experienced climber, having rescued many people lost in the canyon. This is why he doesn't make much conversation with her while they start ascending the rocky terrain together. All Davy manages to learn about him is that he wants to be called Wolf. Whether it is a name or a surname, she doesn't know yet. When they finally get back to Davy's bike and can have a conversation again, Davy finds it in her to be playful with him and introduces herself as Tiger to him. Wolf wanted to be vague while sharing his identity, so she will do the same too. Wolf is the first person to be friendly with her in New Mexico. The positive feeling that is caused by this meeting follows her throughout the rest of the day, until suddenly a vision of her father comes over her. In this image, her father is standing behind a bar, gazing at her with a face full of sun and love. The recurring visions of this man seem to often come to Gwen as well. In the next scene, they are all visiting Bitsy in the museum when a sudden and uncontrollable anxiety attack forces Gwen to get away from the crowd. That night, Davy entered her room, but the mother remained swallowed by grief. Today, Davy learned that Walter's job is to design weapons for national security. Now, she finds herself pouring all the anger out on him for doing such a violent job. That night, when she's resting in her room, Bitsy enters her room. Smiling genuinely, she lets her know that she feels responsible for her and Jason's well-being. Gwen's is going to need a lot of time to get better, and in the meantime, she wants her kids to start going to school here. Bitsy seems to stress this idea quite harshly, and despite Davy's strong resistance, she finishes up the conversation by saying that the matter has already been decided. Entering the literature class for the first time the next morning is quite stressful for Davy. The teacher pairs her up with a girl named Jane to help her get back to date with the study material. Coming back home with her after school, she gets to know this person better. Jane seems to carry a bottle full of vodka to school. She's very used to large amounts of alcohol. They go into a bookshop when Jane asks her about her father. Not knowing how to share the truth, Davy tells her that her father is in India right now and goes over to the counter to avoid any further questions. There, however, she sees an object that reminds her of her father even more. The memory starts floating up into her consciousness. Here, she's going to the beach with a boy and says goodbye to her father, who's clearly worried. He asks her to come back before it's dark. 
This is an extremely warm memory, but after it flashes through her mind, a sudden panic attack goes through her. Her heart starts racing, and struggling to breathe, she dashes out of the store. After a few minutes, she's walking into the wilderness again when she sees Wolf climbing. Noticing a friendly figure seems to change her mood instantly. She calls him and listens to him as he shows her the caves that he was climbing towards. His ancestors used to live there a while ago, and if Davy ever gets a decent pair of climbing shoes, he will be glad to guide her up there. Davy looks at this boy and sees a mind that is purely in sync with the environment. He seems to notice stuff that others fail to see as well. She is assured of this when Wolf emphasizes kindly that her smile seems bright, but her eyes are filled with sorrow. And instead of dashing inside her personal space and asking many questions, he gets interested if she wants to talk about it. Davy answers that she doesn't want to talk about it now, but this simple act of kindness assures her that if a time ever comes when the sorrow becomes unendurable, Wolf will be the one she will share it with. That night, she and Jason are looking at the stars and talking about their mother's current state. In this calm atmosphere, they both seem to feel a little relieved. But when Davy prepares to go to bed that night, she overhears a conversation between Bitsy and Walter. The latter complained to her wife about the people who suddenly filled her everyday life. Her work is starting to be affected by this dramatic change, and he's not happy about it. Bitsy, however, feels responsible to help out her sister in these gloomy times, and she will have them here as long as it takes for them to get back on their feet again. The next day, one of her weird classmates, Danielle, comes up to her and asks her to join the school's medieval jousting club. At first, Davy tries to reject this offer politely, saying that she has a lot of responsibilities back home and cannot attend the meetings, but the girl begins questioning her rigorously. Finally, she manages to corner Davy, but out of nowhere, Jane approaches them and saves her. She says that Davy and she are volunteering in the hospital together. Danielle walks away disappointed, and this is how Davy starts volunteering at the hospital. During her first day, she meets with a very talkative patient by the name of Willie Ortiz. He shows her a rewind toy his son brought from California with a face full of pride. Then he asks her to take it with her if she likes it. Davy isn't really sure that she is allowed to take things from her patients, so she refuses to take them. A subject of death suddenly enters their conversation then. Willie says that he won't be around for long, and once he's gone, he wants her to have the toy. A desire to speak leaves Davy's system completely. She forces herself to politely leave Willie, but before he goes, the latter attempts to inspire her, urging her to do things that will make her happy. Perhaps these are the words that motivated Davy's actions that day. She gets some climbing shoes and, together with Wolf, starts ascending the rocky mountain. She manages to climb surprisingly well and rests in the caves where Tiwa people used to live. Here, the two share an intimate moment. Wolf remembers that when he was younger, he used to often climb here with his father. He hopes that this never changes. For a man who's so familiar with the ways of nature, this logical mistake is unexpected. Davy emphasizes that nothing ever stays the same. She has much more experience in this regard. That night, she enters Gwen's room and approaches her slowly. Her mother is completely unresponsive, and little by little, Davy becomes desperate. Gwen has to get up. She also must stop taking the medications that put her in this catatonic state. Her kids need her, but as Gwen whispers, she is not the same person anymore. The person who could also be blamed for Gwen's current state is Bitsy. She has no kids of her own, and she seems eager to keep her sister's children by her side. This might be the reason why she gets those medications for her sister and reinforces Gwen's depressive state instead of pushing her towards better ways to overcome grief. Davy is a very smart person. She seems to notice this underlying intention in her aunt. When Jane visits them the next day, she tells Davy that this house was once owned by Oppenheimer himself. A very popular boy in school by the name of Ted calls her then and asks her to go on a date. Jane is super excited but anxious as well. She asks Davy to tag along. She can be paired with Reuben, and the four of them can have a double date. Jane pauses here for a second, thinking that Davy could have a boyfriend. The latter, however, says that she wasn't dating anyone before she moved out here. Whether it is a lie or not, we don't know yet. That evening, the four teenagers had a lot of fun together. Reuben turns out to be a lovely guy. In one moment, the four of them enter someone else's car, and as Ted and Jane start making out in the back seat, a memory pops into Davy's mind. Inside the memory, she opens a door to a boy, who asks her to go on a beach with him to talk about something that went down before. The thing that they are going to discuss seems quite important. In the present, she doesn't appreciate the kissing noises coming from behind, but soon this noise stops. Jane suddenly becomes sick and vomits on the hood of the car. Naturally, Ted, the irresponsible kid, decides to just walk away after this incident. And so, Reuben and Davy are forced to take the alcohol poison Jane home. The next morning, Gwen finally leaves her bedroom and comes out to have breakfast. Davy is extremely happy to see her mother with a bright face and sane eyes. Before going to school, she even notices how Gwen puts her medication in the trash and smiles at her genuinely. The day starts out perfectly. Later that day, at the hospital, Willie introduces her to his son. Davy is extremely surprised when she sees that it is Wolf standing in front of her. 
His name turns out to be Martin, and he seems to be quite successful academically, as Willie suggests. Now Davy remembers how Wolf was saying that he didn't want things to change, and she sees that moment in a completely different light. While talking about his academic prowess, Willie mentions that he will be the first in his family to go to college. The old man is clearly trying to advertise his son to Davy, and once Martin gets closer to him, he talks highly of Davy too. He's clearly rooting for them to be together. Shortly after, when Tiger and Wolf are walking along the hospital corridor, the latter seems particularly upset. Davy decides to tell him about her father then. This is the first time she tells this to someone outside of family, and she makes the right choice. Martin is the one who can understand her grief the most. That night, Davy spectates something in the house that upsets her a lot. Walter and Bitsy invite a stranger named Ned and introduce him to Gwen. They go on what seems like a double date then. After she is left alone with Jason, she realizes something that stirs her up. Jason has never cried for his father's passing. After chasing him around the house playfully, she holds her down and asks him why it is that he doesn't miss their father. The kid's cheeks become red, and he looks as if he's very close to crying. But he holds his emotions harshly until they explode out of him. Clearly, he has been trying to hold his tears inside, not to seem weak in front of his family. Unfortunately, this wasn't the correct way to help him deal with his emotions. Davy feels guilty. She was angry and wasn't thinking straight. Jane's family takes Reuben, Jane, and Davy to Santa Fe the next day. Davy finds it tough to see a warm father-daughter relationship. Time flies, then, and soon, Christmas comes. The dense party is not a place she wants to be, so we see her going over to her room and unpacking a candle she bought back in Santa Fe. It is her gift to her father and a testament to her deep desire that he be here. A car arrives in driveway, and looking over her window, she sees Wolf. The house has been full of people, and regardless of this, Davy has been feeling so lonely. Now, however, seeing the face of Martin, she feels an unusual warmth going through her body. Coming here on Christmas is a great gesture from Wolf. It makes Davy want to embrace him and kiss him, and this is exactly what she does. As light snow falls down on them, they stand in freezing winter intertwined. The next day, Willie urges her to enter a professional swimming team. She has a shoulder for it. He had no time to learn how to swim himself. His life's adventure doesn't include any good memories with water, but it is alright, since soon enough, he will go through another bigger adventure. Wolf picks Davy up from school in the next scene and surprises her by taking her to his family. A ceremony is about to be held in the village, and the members of the tribe will take Davy with open arms. The latter spends a very interesting time there. This culture is fascinating to her. When the chief of the family makes a speech in the next scene, Davy learns that this is a reunion ceremony, held so that nobody feels alone. The connection between an individual and a group is strengthened during this ceremony. It is truly a wonderful tradition, and this time, Martin is the one sitting in the center. During this tough time of his life, this might be exactly what he needs. The day still ends on a negative note, however. When Wolf brings her home, he lets her know sorrowfully that he will have to leave soon. He doesn't intend to go back, either. Their goodbye is silent and quick as Davy gets angry at him and gets out of his truck. To add to her frustrations, Betsy starts questioning her once she enters the house. She acts as her mother and allows herself to discipline her. Davy looks at Gwen then and points out that she's changing. She shouldn't be allowing her sister to question her like that. Here, even Walter decides to intervene, ordering Davy harshly to apologize to Gwen, but the latter takes her daughter's side on this. Finally, the conflict is put to an end by Jason, who shatters a plate intentionally. The next day, there is an audition for a singing competition at her school. She is sitting among the audience, still in a gloomy mood, when Jane arrives. She wants to audition today too, but, as Davy points out, she's too drunk to do it. Still, when she's called to come up to Stange, she wiggles her way towards the front and does her best to sing. She still embarrasses herself, however, and as she runs outside the hall to throw up, Davy stands up to follow her. This is exactly when she's called to the stage, though. Davy didn't know that she was signed up. It seems that Reuben was the one doing it for her. Her name is repeated on stage, and after a moment of contemplation, she decides to go for it. She sings Anytime by Eddie Arnold quite well. The singing teacher is surprised by her talent. She gives her some music to rehearse and hopes to see her again on Monday. Shortly after, she looks for Jane in the bathroom and finds her passed out there. Jane is desperate, she knows she made a fool of herself, and Davy understands that she has a real problem. The fact that her friend isn't admitting to it is upsetting to her, and she expresses it. But suddenly, Jane turns it around on her, saying that she isn't the one to talk about denial. She knows that Gwen lied to her about her father being in India earlier. Their heated conversation is put to an end quickly, so the fight isn't resolved. Tension rises that night when Walter decides to discipline her again. He comes up to her, turns on the TV, and tells her to study. Naturally, Davy is in no position to endure this kind of attitude from a man who is practically a stranger to her. And to add to all of it, unexpectedly, Walter starts mocking her father, saying that he was a failure with no education. He follows this up by saying that it is his fault that Gwen is in this position right now. Davy is infuriated. This arrogant man has no right to talk to her father in this manner. She curses at him and gets a slap in the face. All in rage, she breaks down in her room. 
This is the way the day ends. The next day, she enters Willie's room with a bright face and is frozen to the floor after seeing that it's empty. He runs to the reception then and learns that last night he passed away. Martin seems to have been with him when it happened, and he seems to have also left a letter in Davy's name. When she is given the letter, she sees the toy inside and a note that brings joy and sorrow at the same time. The rest of the day is heavy for her. Perhaps this is why she remembers the time when she said the last goodbye to her father. In this memory, they sing a song about saying goodbye. She wants him to be by her side in this moment. She needs her as badly as ever. The singing competition is held in the next scene. As Reuben makes a dazzling performance, Jane helps Davy get prepared to go on stage. According to the plan, she should be singing anytime, but now this plan has changed. When she walks up on the stage, she sings the song that reminds her of her father. These are the words she sang to him when she last saw his face. While singing, she manages to hold back her tears. She's so immersed in the song that she doesn't even notice Wolf among the audience, and once the performance is over, she runs away as tears start falling from her eyes uncontrollably. Now, as the memories are racing in her mind, she can almost hear the gunshots that ended her dad. In the memory, she is kissing the boy we saw earlier when the shots were fired. She runs to the cafe as quickly as possible, waiting for the worst, and she sees her father lying on the floor, covered in blood, asking desperately for help. The ambulance is late, and the wounds are fatal. That night, Wolf finds her sitting on a meadow alone. The late grief has finally come over her. Martin puts a blanket over her shoulders, and Davy doesn't even have to look to know who it is. She tells her about the robbery then. Some guy shot her father in the chest three times for not more than $67. It feels like there is nowhere to go, but suddenly, Martin gives her the feather that was granted to him during the relationship ceremony. It is a testament to friendship and to the fact that, in the toughest of times, one can lean on another and keep on living. In this moment, Wolf shares a portion of her grief and makes it easier for her to go through it. The next day, Davy and Gwen are finally spending some time alone. The latter is sorry for her absence. She admits that she was too afraid to talk to her about what happened, but now she's ready to listen. Today, she will figure out how to get out of the situation they find themselves in. After Walter and Betsy urge her to marry Ned in the next scene, Gwen tells them that she intends to go back home with her children. Betsy becomes upset, but Davy is so proud of her mother. After she tries to empathize with Betsy in the kitchen, Davy goes to her room and opens her wardrobe. The package is still inside, and she takes it out into the caves. Finally, we get to see what it is. Inside the package, the clothes that Davy wore on that painful day are stored. The shirt is still stained by her father's blood. That day in the cave, she finally said goodbye to him in tears. This doesn't mean that she will never think about him anymore. This only means that she is now ready to move on. She buries the clothes under rocks and moves out into the sun. She climbs down the steep and rocky mountain, at the foot of which Wolf is waiting for her. He gives her a very interesting item here. It is a tiger's eye, the stone that is supposed to give her a sense of clarity and hope in the darkest of times. The complex trail of grief, pain, and conflict is now fully conquered by Davy, and she can finally follow Willie's advice and dive headfirst into the ocean to swim. 